It's the most wonderful day of the year. It's Easter Sunday and Jesus Christ is risen. And we've got a multitude of reasons to rejoice because of that. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our online service today and I invite you to worship along with us. Uh, we're going to have some worship together. We're going to have a special song, a special video, and a word that I believe is going to help us to grasp hold of what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. So welcome to this service. Now worship along with us.
Victor! 
I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all Today we're going to be talking about the perfect Passover because when Jesus died on the cross, he chose the time and place of his death. 
He deliberately went into Jerusalem just before the Passover festival. And Jesus very deliberately and self-consciously chose to die at Passover time. And the reason for that was because he was the fulfillment of the perfect Passover. Now, Passover, of course, goes back to the book of Exodus when the Israelites were living in slavery and they were suffering greatly. And God called Moses and Moses uh, confronted uh, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, and uh, called plagues down on Egypt and demanded that Pharaoh would let the people of God go. And Pharaoh just kept refusing until Moses said, OK, then God's going to bring a curse. He's going to bring a plague upon this land greater than anything you have ever seen or ever imagined. And uh, God told the Israelites, he said, look, horror is going to be unleashed upon this land. And you've got to do exactly what I say if you're going to survive it. Now, the Israelites understood that because uh, they knew their history. They, they knew what had happened with Abraham's nephew, Lot, back in the book of Genesis, whenever he had been in Sodom and God judged Sodom uh, and brought destruction upon that place. But God said to Lot and his family, if you do exactly what I tell you to do, you're going to be okay. And Lot's wife didn't do what God told her to do. She basically looked back when she was told not to look back. And, and as a result, she missed out on the salvation and deliverance that the rest of the family received that day. So the Israelites understood this. This was clear. This was the kind of stuff they understood. God's going to bring uh, destruction and we've got to do exactly what God tells us to do. And so what God told them to do was they had to kill a lamb. They had to sacrifice this lamb. It had to be a, an unblemished, a perfect lamb and not a bone of its body was to be broken. And they were to kill that lamb and they were to put its blood on the door frames of their houses. They were to put blood up on the top, on the lintel and also on the doorposts on either side. And then they had to eat a special meal. And that special meal included the flesh of the lamb that had been sacrificed, the meat and also bread and also drinking wine. And they had, while they ate the meal, they had to be dressed ready for a journey. I mean, I mean, it would be the equivalent of us eating a meal with our suitcases packed beside us as we eat, ready to go in an instant. And there, dressed up all ready for a journey, they sat and they waited. And as they waited, when it got to midnight, they could hear all kinds of stuff taking place because the Bible tells us that in the cities and the towns where the Egyptians lived, the, the, the firstborn in every household died and there was a wailing and a weeping and a screaming and a, a, a roaring such as Egypt had never heard in its history. And where the Israelites were, we're told there was absolute silence. Not even a dog was barking. And I can just see these Israelites crouched in their homes. They've eaten the meal. They're, they're dressed, ready for a journey, but they're not quite sure what's going to come next. And then they hear all this commotion coming from the Egyptian cities and they know something dreadful is taking place. And then in, uh, in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 29, it says, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. And Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. But what if it didn't work? I don't mean not, not what if, I'm not saying what if people didn't die, but what if the Egyptians reacted differently to what Moses had said would happen. What, what if instead of letting the people go, they were so overcome by grief and rage that they would send their powerful army out and slaughter all of the Israelites? The, the Israelites didn't know. And it says, during the night, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you have requested. And so, I can just see the Israelites coming out of their houses the next morning and realizing they've made it through the night. The Egyptians haven't come and slaughtered them. And then messengers arrive from Moses to say, right, everybody, let's go. We're leaving this place. We're getting out of here. Our slavery is over. The Israelites remembered this event every year because it was what basically tied them together as a nation. 
They were different. They were special. A lamb had died in their place to set them free from slavery. And yet their descendants would end up back in slavery again. They ended up in slavery to the Babylonians. They ended up being slaves to the Persians. They ended up being defeated and occupied by Syrians, occupied by the Romans. And they realized they needed another Passover. Because their biggest problem wasn't the Egyptians, wasn't the Babylonians, it wasn't the Persians or the Syrians or the Romans. The biggest problem looked back at them from their mirror every morning when they got up. Because their biggest problem was sin, their own sin, the sin in their lives. And that sin always ended up bringing defeat and disgrace and death. So what they began to do at their Passover meals, they began to leave an empty chair, believing that God was going to raise up another prophet like Moses that would come and give them another Passover. They needed another Passover. And they waited. They waited for centuries. And it wasn't happening. And then in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29, we read that John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said to his disciples, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's why people kept asking Jesus, all the, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? Are you the one who's going to set us free? Are you the, going to, the one who's going to bring us a new Passover that we can no longer be in slavery, no longer be occupied by the Romans? Are you the new Moses? And Jesus, in response, would talk about being crucified, would talk about being raised from the dead. He, he was saying to them, I'm not just the new Moses, I'm I'm the new lamb. I'm the new Passover lamb who's going to set you free. And he, like that Passover lamb, he was spotless. He was without sin, without blemish. And when they gathered in that upper room on that Easter week, it was not so much to remember the old Passover, but it was to launch the new Passover. You know, when we read about the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, they were supposed to eat lamb. But we're not told about any lamb whatsoever. We're told they broke bread. They had the bread, they had the wine, but no lamb. Why? Because Jesus was the new lamb. He was the lamb of God. Luke 22, verse 20, it says, In the same way after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. They had been set free from slavery in the, under the old covenant by the lamb that was sacrificed in Egypt on that first Passover night. But now Jesus is saying, My blood is the blood of the new covenant. And just as the blood in the first Passover was applied to the door frame, well, the cross became the doorway to salvation for us. The cross became the way to freedom from sin. The cross became the doorway to freedom from slavery. And when Jesus said on the cross, it's finished, he meant what he said. The job was done. The price was paid. The Lamb of God had taken away the sin of the world. And then we're told that he died. And the soldiers came in John 19, 32, 33. It says, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus because they wanted to make sure they were dead so they would get them buried before the, the Sabbath day started. And he broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus to hasten his death and and then those of the other, and I can imagine all the apostles watching and saying, man, if they break Jesus' legs, he can't be the new Passover lamb because the lamb, it was said not a bone of his body will be broken. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. And then he's put in the tomb. And the, and the disciples all go back to Mary and Martha's house in Bethany and, and they wait. Now, the issue was not whether a dead man could be raised from the dead or not. They knew he could. 
What, what? I mean, they're in Mary and Martha's house. They've got Lazarus sat beside them, the guy who was raised from the dead after four days. The issue is not whether a dead man could be raised from the dead or not. The issue was, had this new Passover worked? In the same way that with the first Passover, everything happened at midnight, but the Israelites didn't find out that everything had been successful until the next morning when Moses told them, right lads, let's go, we're getting out of here, Pharaoh's letting us go. Up to that point, they thought well, maybe maybe the first thing we'll see in the morning when we open our doors and God had told them not to go out until daybreak, maybe the first thing we'll see is an army waiting to slaughter us. But no, it worked. The first Passover worked. And so they're waiting now for this new Passover. Did it work? Yeah, we know Jesus can raise people from the dead, but this time, this wasn't a fight against Pharaoh or even a fight against the Roman emperor. This was a fight against death himself. Death and sin and everything that's dragged us down for generations. Did it work? And they waited all night. The Israelite first Passover, they waited one night, but these guys had to wait all the next day, all through Saturday. And then all night again, until dawn again, until the Sabbath was over. And then on dawn on Sunday, we're told in Matthew chapter 28, after the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who is crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The new Passover was accomplished. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead was not just that a dead man had been raised to life again. It was the proof that the waiting was over. And it was the proof that the Passover had worked, that the, the victory over death had been won, that they were no longer condemned to death. They were no longer trapped in slavery because the Passover had worked. Not just freedom from slavery like with the Egyptians, but freedom from sin and shame. Not just victory over Egypt or Babylon or Syria or Persia or Rome, but victory over death itself. And just as those Israelites after the first Passover said, we're special, we're different. A lamb died in our place. Now these apostles said the same thing, but the lamb that had died in their place was the lamb of God himself. Jesus Christ. And, and then they began to understand that this was not just for Jewish people. Remember what John the Baptist said? The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was for everybody, not just Jews. It was for the whole world. It was for anyone who would reach out in faith to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. You know, for me, that happened on the 22nd of February, 1981, when I understood and it cut me to the heart to understand that Jesus had died for me and been raised from the dead for my sins, as according to the Bible. And I want to tell you that on that day, I asked Jesus to forgive me. I asked him to come into my life. I put my, put my faith in him and he changed my life forever. And I know for many of you watching this, I don't know, some of you can remember the date. Some of you can't remember, but you know it definitely happened. So for many of you, there's another date. Mine was the 22nd of February, 1981. But for some people, it can be today. There's people watching this online service who have never yet taken that step of faith. You can do it right now. 
We can stop right now and pray. In fact, let's do that. I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, just, just pray these words along with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. I thank you that Jesus died on the cross. I thank you that the Passover lamb was raised from the dead. I thank you that the sacrifice was accepted. I thank you that the power of sin is broken. I thank you that I can have new life. And I invite Jesus to come into my life. I pray that he would change my heart forever. A change in me so radical. It's like being born all over again. Jesus, come into my life. Change my life. Help me live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed along with me there for the first time, I would invite you to send me an email and let me know. My email address is nick at solidrock.ie. And I would love to hear from you. Just drop me an email. Just say, I prayed that prayer and I, I believe Jesus came into my life. But, you know, that's not the end. That's not the end of what we're talking about. It's actually the beginning. It's the beginning of knowing God in a real relationship, not just as a God you've heard about, not just a God who's way up there somewhere, but a, but a God who's so close that he's a friend that stays closer than a brother and you can enjoy a real relationship with him. That's what this is the start of. It's the beginning of a changed life. It's the beginning of answered prayer, not just offering up prayers and hoping something changes somehow, but knowing that God answers prayer. It's the beginning of real freedom, not being a slave anymore to sin. It's the beginning of real peace, not having to be in turmoil, not having to be ashamed, not having to carry guilt around with us. It's the beginning of real love, not the selfish kind of love that says, well, if I, if you, I'll give you what you want, if you give me what I want, but just pure love from God, that love that overcome obstacles, love that endures all things. And it's the beginning of real joy, because there is a joy to be found in following Jesus Christ that is to be found absolutely nowhere else. All this happens because the Passover lamb took away the sins of the world. And the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is what assures us that everything has changed forever. Praise God. Just going to share with you a few notices and then we'll close by saying the grace together. I want to say a huge thank you to Everybody who took part in our Easter Saturday Family Fest yesterday, it was an incredible day. Uh, oh, we had, we I think up to a thousand people came through the church and uh, we, there was food from so many different nations. It was, uh, we had the trad music playing. It was a wonderful event and so many people just building connections and making new friends. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who, helped make that happen and cooked food or took part or came and ate food. Thank you for being part of it. Uh, we have no Monday night meeting this week. Uh, no, no meeting tomorrow night because it's Easter Monday. So I have the evening off, do something, do something fun with friends or family. Uh, no Thursday night discipleship group either this week. Uh, we, we will, of course, have our Sunday services again next Sunday. 10 o'clock and at 12 noon and our online service will be on again at goes online about 9 a.m in the morning uh, also we do have our online uh, wednesday night bible study that that'll be on this wednesday upon this rock we're continuing the study we started last week on ephesians and that's on wednesday night at 7 30 p.m and you can access all of our online content through our website www.solidrock.ie or through our facebook uh, Solid Rock Drogheda or through our YouTube channel Solid Rock Drogheda and we also have our Take Fives which is a five minute daily devotional that goes up uh, every every day Monday to Saturday and we also have a one minute scripture and prayer a video a short one minute video that we post up every day Sundays included and you can access that through the TikTok uh, EA Ireland 
or through our church Facebook page as well. We want to thank everybody that's participating in our 24-7 prayer and uh, praise God word is getting around Ireland that there's a church in Drogheda that's been praying for over two years now and has no intention of stopping. Well I tell you what you're doing is truly remarkable and if you'd like to be part of our non-stop 24-7 prayer chain uh, you can find an online rota on our website or on our Facebook page. You just follow the links there and you can sign yourself in for an hour of prayer and be part of this ongoing miracle of prayer. And we do want to thank everybody that is giving to the church. People have been giving so wonderfully and generously, even through a pandemic. And it's remarkable what we've been able to achieve. Uh, but we continue on and we thank you. Many of you now give online. We thank you for that. We've got the IBAN and the BIC number and all the information you need up on the on the on the screen now it's also available on the website there's also a paypal link available on the website um, or you if you prefer to give cash or check come along to one of our in-person services and uh, we don't have an offering basket around anymore but we do have boxes on the back walls where you can put your tithe and offering into an envelope and drop it off there and if you want to give to our uh, ukraine appeal uh, then what you can do is just mark on the envelope Ukraine or if you're giving online just make sure somewhere in the online giving we can see the word Ukraine there and we'll make sure that that's where that money goes to but uh, however you choose to give I want to thank you for your incredible giving as a church that enables us to keep on doing so much for the Lord and his kingdom and his name. Uh, thank you for being with us for this online service. And now it simply remains for us to say the grace together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>